Hello everyone, this is John Harris, director of Living Waters Europe. I hope you're all very well. Today I'm going to talk about an interesting subject, Christmas. Apparently Christmas is a controversial subject these days. Some say we should not celebrate Christmas because Jesus was not born on the 25th of December. They say it's a pagan festival that Christians adopted and that Christians are now just copying what pagans do. And the Bible tells us not to do that. So today we're going to look at whether Christmas is a pagan festival and whether Christians should be celebrating it. So the first obvious question to ask is, was Jesus even born on the 25th of December? How about the year? Do we even know what year Jesus was born in? But just before we start, let me make it clear. Today I'm not talking about Christmas trees, Santa Claus, mistletoe or Yule log. I'm just focusing on the birth of Jesus. Maybe we can do these other things on another day. But first things first, let's get some facts straight. BC stands for before Christ and AD stands for Anno Domini or Anno Domini depending on where you come from, which means the year of our Lord in medieval Latin. And in case you're interested, it used to be AM, Anno Matrim, which was also known as Anno Diocletian, or in Latin, Anno Diocletiani. This was named after the Roman Empire, Diocletian, who started the last main persecution against Christians. The dating system was based on the year of his rule or the year of his reign in AD 284. So AD 284 was year one. But Dionysius, or Dionysius, exiguous in AD 525, changed that because he didn't like to be kept reminded of a tyrant who persecuted Christians. So AD was not used until the 6th century. So here are some assumptions. Jesus was born in 0 BC. Some say Jesus was born in 4 BC. And of course, some say Jesus was born on the 25th of December. First of all, Jesus couldn't have ever been born in 0 BC. There is no such thing as 0 BC. That's because, believe it or not, the Anno Domini calendar system doesn't have 0 BC. It went from 1 BC to 1 AD. Nice and simple. Or maybe not so nice and simple. Some say Jesus was born in 4 BC because of the first century famous historian Flavius Josephus, who said that a lunar eclipse happened shortly before Herod's death, followed by the Passover. Now, since the Passover was based on the lunar calendar, in theory, this shouldn't be that difficult to work out. Now, those who say Jesus was born in 4 BC say it because there was an eclipse on the 13th of March, 4 BC, which was 29 days before the Passover. So they figured Herod must have died and buried before these 29 days, followed by the Passover celebration, which means Josephus would be right. The lunar eclipse would have happened before Herod died and then the Passover took place. That should settle it, except, and it is a big except. This lunar eclipse wasn't the only eclipse we had during that time. There were other lunar eclipses that were visible from there. In fact, there were at least two lunar eclipses in 5 BC and two more in 1 BC. So some people thought it must have been anywhere between 6 BC and 4 BC, and some even say 7 BC. It seems a little messed up. Clearly using eclipse references is not really helping to know the year Jesus was born. And what about the month? Was Jesus even born in December 25th? Did we at least get the month right? Well, that couldn't be right either. Because as you know, the angels gave the shepherds the message on the birth of Christ. This was out in the open field because Luke chapter 2 verse 8 says the shepherds lived out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. That means they were out in the open field and it would have been very, very cold to keep watch over their flock at night. But some would say, wait a minute, the weather in the Middle East is not that cold during that time, you know? Well, I'm not that convinced. I'm from the Middle East and it's cold enough, trust me. And on top of that, we have records that tell us the shepherds of Judea did not live out nor keep their flocks in the open fields any later than about the end of October. And if that's not enough, the Bible tells us that at the time of the birth of Jesus, Caesar Augustus had announced that all the world should be taxed and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. That's why Joseph went with his wife to Bethlehem, right? 
Certainly this could not have happened in winter because travel at that time of the year was very difficult. So it's unlikely Caesar would make the citizens of the Roman Empire go back to their native homes in the middle of winter. Apparently even Caesar's army would avoid marching during the winter season. How much less likely would he make the citizens do it? No wonder Jesus said and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Now, if it were easy in winter, Jesus wouldn't have said that. So it couldn't have been in winter and certainly not in December. So this is what we know. Jesus was not born in 0 BC. We don't even know whether he was born in 4, 5, 6 or even 7 BC and he was not born on the 25th of December. But apart from that, we know everything. So there you have it. Christmas is cancelled, you can get rid of that Christmas t-shirt and we can all go home and live happily ever after. Of course I'm just kidding, I'm not ready to give up Christmas yet. Is there any way we could reliably know when Jesus was born? Well maybe. Let's see if we can work this out historically. I'm going to use some information from Tertullian. But who is Tertullian? Well he was an early Christian author from Carthage in the Roman province of Africa. He was an early Christian apologist and a polemicist against heresy, including contemporary Christian Gnosticism. Tertullian has been called the father of Latin Christianity and the founder of Western theology. So this guy is quite knowledgeable and we should be able to trust him. Let's see if we can work out the year of Jesus' birth from his quotes. We have a quote from Tertullian who said that Augustus died 15 years after Jesus' birth. Well, it just happens we know when Augustus died. It was in 14 AD. If we subtract 15 years from 14 AD, you get 2 BC. Because remember, there is no 0 BC. That puts Jesus' birth in 2 BC. So far, so good. Tertullian also said that Jesus was born 41 years after Augustus started his reign. Well, we happen to know when Augustus started his reign. It was in autumn 43 BC. So if we do a simple calculation, subtracting 41 years from 43 BC, you get, surprise, surprise, 2 BC again. That's good news because Tertullian is consistent with his dates. It doesn't stop there. Tertullian also said that Jesus was born 28 years after Cleopatra died. Well, guess what? We know when Cleopatra died, she died in 30 BC. So if we subtract 28 years from 30 BC, what do we get? We get 2 BC again. Things are looking good. It's looking like Jesus was born in 2 BC. That's great. But let's bring another historian just to be sure. This time we're going to bring in the famous Eusebius. Who is Eusebius? Well, Eusebius was a famous writer who lived around the 3rd century. He was a historian of Christianity, exegete and Christian polemicist. He became the Bishop of Caesarea Maritima about 314 AD. Together with Pamphilus, he was a scholar of the biblical canon and is regarded as one of the most learned Christians of his time. He was also known as the father of church history. Now that's not to be confused with the title of church father who are Christian theologians who established the doctrinal foundations of Christianity. He produced the ecclesiastical history on the life of Pamphilus, the Chronicle and on the Martyrs. So this guy knows quite a bit about church history and seems trustworthy. Let's see what he had to say about the birth of Jesus. Eusebius said that the birth of Jesus was on the 42nd year of the reign of Augustus. Don't be confused. Earlier I said Tertullian said that Jesus was born 41 years after Augustus' reign. That's still correct, but now Eusebius is saying it's on the 42nd year of Augustus' reign. These are both the same, so Eusebius agrees with Tertullian. Seeing that Augustus started his reign in autumn of 43 BC, the 42nd year would have to be from autumn 2 BC to autumn 1 BC. Eusebius is being very specific here. He also said that this happened on the 28th year from when the Roman Empire took over Egypt which of course happened after Cleopatra and Antony died, right? Well, it turns out we happen to know when this happened. It was in autumn 30 BC. Seeing that this takeover was in autumn 30 BC, the 28th year would go from autumn 3 BC to the autumn of 2 BC. Now, obviously the place where both these dates overlap would have to be the right date, which turns out to be 2 BC again. 
Once again, it seems to match the dates we got from Tertullian. Not only does this confirm Tertullian's year for the birth of Jesus, but we now also have this season. It's in autumn. So we got the year confirmed and now even have the season. It's all looking good. Let's see if we can be a little more ambitious and work out the month and day. We know from the Bible that the shepherds lived out in the fields and the angels gave the shepherds the message about the birth of Jesus. We know from other sources that the shepherds of Judea did not live nor keep their flocks in the open fields any later than about the end of October, and that the shepherds always bring their flocks in from the mountain slopes and fields no later than the 15th of October. We also know from the Bible that at the time of the birth of Jesus, Caesar Augustus had announced that all the world should be taxed, and all went to be taxed and everyone into his own city, which is why Joseph went with his wife to Bethlehem. We also know from other sources that the taxations always took place at the end of the harvest, which was sometime in September or October, which is a much more logical time for taxation and travel. So these seem to suggest that all this must have happened no later than September or October, but I think we can do better than that using other Bible verses. For example, we know from Luke chapter 1 that John the Baptist's mother is Elizabeth. Elizabeth and Mary were related. Well, traditionally, they are believed to be cousins. Elizabeth was married to a priest called Zacharias. John was conceived six months before Jesus. Zacharias was a priest of the division of Abijah. We also know from 1 Chronicles 24 and 2 Chronicles 23 that priests were divided into 24 courses, and each course took charge in the temple for one week, from Sabbath to Sabbath. Actually, it's eight days for each priest because their duties on the Sabbath overlap between one division and the next, but it was still seven days. We also know that Abijah was the eighth course, and from Luke chapter 1 and 3, we know that John was conceived while Zacharias was serving his course. And it's important to remember that John started his ministry on the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And finally, the minimum age for the ministry was 30. If we know all this, then to get a date, the only thing we need to know is any of the dates of any of the divisions for any of the priests. And thankfully, we have exactly that. When the temple was destroyed by Titus on August 5th, 70 AD, the first course of priests had just taken office. Since the course of Abijah was the eighth course, we can track backwards and determine that Zacharias would have ended his duties on July 13th, 3 BC. If the birth of John took place 280 days later, it would have been on April 19th or the 20th, 2 BC, precisely on Passover of that year. Wow! I don't know if you've noticed, but if this is true, then several amazing things come out of this. First of all, don't forget that John the Baptist was born 280 days after Zacharias ended his duties in July 13, 3 BC, because that's when he was conceived according to Luke 1 verses 8 and 13. Let me show you the dates in a timeline so that it's clear and you can follow it better. So far, we know when the temple was destroyed by Titus. It was on August 5th, 70 AD. This was when the first course or first division of priests had just taken office. We know Abijah was the eighth course and we know how long the course lasts. That means we can calculate backwards and work out that Zacharias would have ended his duties on July the 13th, 3 BC, which is when John the Baptist was conceived. So far, so good. Obviously, we expect the birth of John the Baptist to take place nine months later, or 40 weeks, or 280 days later, which brings us to about April the 19th or the 20th, 2 BC, as we've already said. Now, here comes one of the amazing things from these dates. If all these calculations are correct, then this means John the Baptist would have been born precisely on Passover of that year. Now, why is that amazing? It's amazing because in the Jewish tradition, during the Passover, they reserve a special seat they call Elijah's seat. They say the Passover is when Elijah will arrive who will announce or herald the coming of the Messiah. He will announce the ultimate redemption. That means Elijah's arrival is expected during the Passover. They normally pour out four cups with wine during the Passover, but sometimes they pour a fifth cup, which is a special cup they call the cup of Elijah. But they don't drink from it. They expect Elijah to come and drink from it himself. They usually pour out the wine into this cup and then send the youngest child to the front door to check if they can see Elijah, to invite him to come in and drink from that cup. This is done year after year. 
And just as expected, Elijah is born on that day, who we know was the one who announces Jesus, the Messiah, the Lamb of God. How fascinating is that? If you want to know more, do a Google search on Elijah's seat at the Passover table or check jewishanswers.org. The Passover study is absolutely fascinating. I'll probably talk about that on another day. Another interesting thing that comes out of these dates is that if John the Baptist was born on April the 19th or 20th, 2 BC, then his 30th birthday, which is when his ministry would have started, would have been in 29 AD. Why is that interesting? Because we know when Augustus died. It was in 14 AD. That means we know when Tiberius took over, which was obviously the same year. 14 AD. So 15 years later would make it 29 AD. So if we got these dates right, that would be exactly the year John the Baptist would have been 30 years old. That means when John the Baptist was 30 years old, Tiberius would have been in his 15th year of reign. And guess what? That's exactly what the Bible says in Luke chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, God's word came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So John the Baptist started his ministry on the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. This confirms the Bible, and it also confirms that we got the right date for John the Baptist at 2 BC. It seems like all these dates are adding up nicely. But what about Jesus? When was he born? Well, that's now easy. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verse 24, that Elizabeth was conceived but kept it a secret for five months. Two verses later, it says that on the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel visited Mary to say that she will conceive a son. In verse 39, it says immediately after that, Mary went to tell Elizabeth and the baby in Elizabeth leaped inside her womb for joy. What does all this mean? Well, assuming that all this happened on the first week of the sixth month, then this event would have taken place on the fourth week of December. So, if Jesus was then born 9 months later, or about 280 days later, then he was born on the 29th of September or thereabouts. If that's true, it means that Jesus was not born in December at all. But what is interesting is that if he was born towards the end of September, then he could have easily been conceived on the 25th of December. And since life starts at conception, then guess what? We can genuinely celebrate the 25th of December as the day God came to Earth. I really hope you find that interesting, but it does get better. If Jesus was born on September the 29th, 2 BC, it is interesting to note that it was also the first of Tishri, the day of the Feast of Trumpets. Now, I don't know if you're getting this, but Tishri is the Jewish seventh month that falls between September and October in our own calendar. So if Jesus was born on September the 29th, 2 BC, then this date is even more significant because that would have been the first of Tishri, which is the day of the Feast of Trumpets. Why is that interesting? Because the 10 days between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement are referred to as Yamim Nureim, the Days of Affliction. The Day of Atonement, the most solemn day on the Jewish calendar, follows on the 10th of Tishri. Even the Jews who honor very little else will make it a point to honor Yom Kippur as a day of repentance, of getting right with God. Most take this day quite seriously. Yom Kippur is the day of Israel's national repentance. The Jews repent both as individuals and as a nation on this day. So on the first of Tishri is the Feast of Trumpets. And this celebration that lasts 10 days ends with the Day of Atonement, the day of national and individual repentance. The first of Tishri is considered one of the two primary Jewish New Years. Now get this. This primary new year, the first of Tishri, represents the day that God created the world and judges humanity. Wow, what a powerful symbolic entrance into humanity. The day that represents God's creation is the day God enters into his own creation. And this celebration ends with a national and individual repentance. And in case you're interested, the second primary new year is the first of Nisan where the Jewish nation celebrates the Passover. This is the month they celebrate their redemption from Egypt. And guess what? Jesus, as the Passover lamb, was betrayed and crucified during this Passover period. Now think about all this. God's entrance and exit from his creation couldn't have been any more meaningful than this. He wonderfully fulfilled such significant celebrations in his birth and in his death on the cross. 
and to make it even more incredible. Christians refer to this Feast of Trumpets as the celebration that represents the second coming of Jesus. If this is correct, then Jesus' first and second coming would have been during the same Jewish celebration period. How amazing is that? What better way to herald the arrival of the Creator into the world than with the celebration of the Feast of Trumpets, the blowing of trumpets to announce His coming? But despite all that, there are some people who will insist that Christians are basically celebrating a pagan festival. They say that Christians chose the 25th of December to compete with the pagan celebration. And to prove this, they will show you how all these pagan deities have celebrated their birthdays on the 25th of December. Here are some examples of how these pagan deities line up with Christmas. Mithra was born on the 25th of December. Horus was born on the 25th of December. Dionysus was born on the 25th of December. Natalis Sol Invictus was celebrated on the 25th of December. And of course, Saturnalia was celebrated on the 25th of December. Clearly, you are all Christian pagans celebrating a pagan festival. But not so fast, my friend. Mithra was not born on the 25th of December. In fact, he was not born at all. He came out fully grown from a rock wearing a torch and a hat. There is no original source that tells us when Mithra was really born. Someone just pulled that date straight out of a hat. Excuse the pun. Also, he didn't do any of these other things. We'll probably talk about these other things on another day. But what about Horus? Well, Horus was not born on the 25th of December either. The only source I can find for Horus is possibly November, but I've heard other suggestions depending on the calendar being used. It could be July the 15th or August the 24th to August 28th. Anyway, none of them say it was in December. By the way, Horus didn't do these other things either. We'll probably have to talk about this on another day too. Dionysus was also not born on the 25th of December. We don't have any original source to support this, but many think he was born twice. Apparently he had two mothers. That's obviously what happens when you have two mothers. The best I could find is that his rebirth was set to January the 6th. What about Natalis Sol Invictus? Was that celebrated on the 25th? Well, yes it was. They actually got that one right at last. Well done. Natalis means nativity or birth. Sol Invictus means unconquerable sun. Sun as in S-U-N. We don't know much about Sol Invictus. We're told there is very little evidence this festival was celebrated before the 4th century. The little we do know tell us that it's more likely the pagans took this date from Christians, proving that Christians were celebrating the birth of Jesus on the 25th of December using sources that goes as far back as the 4th century. So it looks like the pagans were the naughty ones using the Christian Christmas date rather than the other way around. Besides, the unconquerable sun is about the days getting longer. The sun is now conquering the darkness. Isn't that what Jesus is doing? Isn't he conquering sin and darkness? Why can't that be the real 25th of December anyway and the pagans stole it from us? And finally, we come to Saturnalia. Wasn't that celebrated on the 25th of December? Well, actually, no. The actual celebration was on the 17th. To make a long story short, over time, the Romans extended it because they just enjoyed it too much. So it was made longer and longer until eventually it ended up on the 23rd. It never was on the 25th. Interestingly, they did do something very similar to what some people do sometimes on Christmas. They would go house to house or walk down the streets while singing naked. That's not something we do, do we? Please don't do that. So the actual celebration was between December the 17th and December the 23rd. Now, if Christians really wanted to put Christmas on Saturnalia Day to compete with that festival, well, they missed it by two days. They picked the wrong day. It's like if someone wanted to compete with Christmas to reclaim that date, instead of using the same day, the 25th of December, they choose a completely different day, say the 28th or 29th of December, or even the 3rd of January. How would that affect Christmas? It just wouldn't. That would also be a terrible idea because everyone would have run out of money by then. And finally, what if we ignore everything I said? Let's pretend everything I said is wrong. What if the 25th of December is actually a pagan day that Christians took over to celebrate the arrival of Jesus? Even if that were true, I personally wouldn't have a problem with it. 
I don't personally have a problem with repurposing pagan days. The pagans don't get to own a day for themselves. Every day belongs to the Lord. If I can't choose a day because of what some pagan could have done on that particular day, then every day could be a problem. I'm sure I can think of something bad someone did on every day of the year. Does that mean that day is hijacked forever? I don't think so. Even though there is no real support using original sources that December the 25th is a pagan event, so what if it is? What if I wanted to completely reclaim the 25th of December for God? Why is that a problem? Now let's face it, more people celebrate Christmas today with Christ being the center and focus of the celebration than anything else that was ever celebrated on that day in all of history. So we won! That's what it's all about now. It's about Jesus. Nobody knows about Saturnalia anymore. Most people would say, Saturnalia who? Who's this Saturnalia? Nobody cares. Brilliant. The date is reclaimed, mission accomplished, we have succeeded, let's never give it back, especially when it doesn't belong to them in the first place. My recommendation for this year, on the 25th of December, is that you celebrate that day as the day that God entered into his own creation to save humanity from a debt that they could have never paid because of his endless love and mercy for sinners like you and me. Celebrate that day guilt-free, full of joy, and remember to share that truth with others as we are commanded to do. God bless you, and from the entire Living Waters team, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.